Okay, I will. This is that gets my goat. There, I said it. Happy now. Hi, everybody. Welcome. This is Big Anklevich. And this is Rich Outfield. And this is That Gets My Goat. That's right. We're back for our, our winter movie series. We never have really done much for movies in the winter, although every summer, when summer comes around, we always start in on this blockbuster and then that one and that one. And then usually they piddle off by what the last blockbuster usually comes out, what, like June 15th? And then they're just like, ah, screw it. We'll just let Expendables 2 have all the money. <laughs> I don't know what the deal is with that. They open in April now. But anyways, yeah, we usually don't do anything in winter. Although often there are lots of movies that come out. We did talk about Wreck-It Ralph, although by then it was, I think, on video. <laughs> and we talked about Tangled, and but then it might have been on video by then too, I don't know. Luckily, with that gets my goat. It's not that's not the standard, but uh, <laughs> we are usually a little, a few weeks behind at least. Uh, anyways, the first movie of the uh, winter season is uh, Ender's Game, which came out what was it November first, day after Halloween, right? That sounds right. So November first, Ender's Game came out, and yeah, it's. Uh, we saw it together, right? We did, yeah. We saw it together. Uh, instead of podcasting. Yeah, instead of doing our duty. We could have... I mean, we have so much stuff we're supposed to do, but you and I had both worked that day, and we were tired, and instead of driving the extra half hour to your house, we were right by a movie theater, and you drove over and said, okay, if it's about to start right now, we'll go to it. And if, it, if not, if it's already started, then we'll take that as a sign, and we'll go podcast. And it was starting in like six minutes. Yeah. I expected there to not have been a show that late. It was it was like a Monday. It was Monday night. So it shouldn't have been starting at 10.15. And yet it was. So we went and watched it. And I w I'm glad we did because I probably would not have seen it on my own. I'm just too lame and lazy when it comes to that. I mean, I still haven't seen The Hobbit Part 1. And you would think that would obviously be one that I should have seen. And we've even rented The Hobbit at my house, and I didn't see it while we had it. So that's how bad I am. Wait, wait, but how to explain that? By choice, or they just watched it while you were at work? Yeah, or? they watched it when I was at work. They thought, oh, yeah, no, he's already seen it, so we don't need to. And so they took it back, uh -huh. and I never saw it. They made you pay for it, and then they <laughs> took it back. But, yeah, see, that's how bad I am. So I know I probably would have never seen it, which is weird because... Ender's Game is one of my favorite books of all time. Mm -hmm. I've loved it for since way before I was an adult. I think I read it when I was 13, 14, maybe. Cool. I've even, I mean, I guess I can't say I've sort of followed the saga of it, but when I was in college, Orson Scott Card actually came to the college and talked about trying to get Ender's Game made into a movie. And this was t 15 years what is ago. that 15 years before it actually happened but he was all gung-ho about making sure it was exactly like the book and turned out to be what it should be because I guess when he first started trying to, s to sell it to Hollywood he said okay we'll make Ender 16 and him and Petra will be doing it in scene one I believe the phrase was doing it doing it and doing it well yeah yeah because this was the 90s and that was big back then they wanted to make all sorts of arbitrary changes to make it more Hollywood friendly, if you will. More, is it Hollywood friendly? More Hollywood. More typical. More um, cinematic. You know what I mean? There, there are certain tropes that go on in movies, and uh, yeah, they just wanted it to be more like a movie and less like a book. And yeah, I guess love he, interest was the first thing that they wanted, which is weird since Ender is really young. But yeah, they wanted to nip that in the bud, too. They were just like, well, why can't he be a teenager? Why can't he be, you know, something else? And and I guess Card really fought to have it with a child and to, to keep it faithful to the, to the source material to the point where he would turn down the money again and again. He just wanted it done right more than he wanted the paycheck, which is admirable. I mean, I know it's in vogue to hate the man, but, uh, I mean, he really did fight for his work. 
And so for all of these years, they're, they've been trying to make an Ender's game and they didn't do it until, I guess, Gavin Hood said, I'll do what you want me to do. And, uh, pretty much. How, how, how old is that kid that played Ender? He was Ace, the kid. Uh, I'd say he's probably 14. He was the kid from. But maybe he was 13 when the movie was being made. I watch him call it that, uh. From Hugo? Hugo movie, yeah. So you say he was 13 or 14? That's probably about the age Ender was when the book ended, right? Yeah, probably. Because, see, that was one of the things that I thought... The, the hard part about this is I've read the book several times mm-hmm. or listened to the audio of it. So it's hard to look at it just as a movie, you know what I mean? It's hard to look at it and say that was a good movie and not say that was it was missing this and that and this from the book. But isn't that always going to be an issue when somebody's adapting something that you're already familiar with? You yeah. can't help but compare it. Or, and especially the more that you love the source material, the harder it's going to be for them to please you. And that was something that, like you, if we if you hadn't said, let's go see it on Monday, I might have just waited and saw it at a matinee a month from now or waited for it to get to the cheap theaters because I was a little antsy about it. I love that book so much that I thought, well, there's no way they're going to be able to please me. So it's probably better to just not see it or put it off until, you know, people have told me it sucks so many times that when I go see it, I'll be impressed with the things Uh that don't suck. For me, I mean, I've gotten old enough that that's the best way to see a movie (laughs) is to walk in saying, well, this is probably going to suck. Wait until everybody's told you it's terrible. So I'm probably going to love The Hobbit now when I finally go and see it, because no, I've heard nothing no, you but won't. bad things about it. Unless it's possibly worse than everybody says, which I don't know if that could be possible. Well, I, um, this is a little tangent. How much do you love the book, The Hobbit, and how familiar with it are you? I'm not very familiar with it, and I don't love it. Okay. So I won't be hurt by things that are missing. See, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Nothing is missing, so oh, well, I guess that's... See, that's that's funny that we say that, because after watching Ender's Game, I watched that and I thought, you know, it's weird because it's not a long book. It's a really short book. Uh-huh. It's like only 250 pages or something, which is tiny compared to some books these days. And yet... But it has such a progression, a really slow, you know, it builds from this... Then to this, you know, you have the launchy section, and then you have the, in the first army, and didn't he go to another army? I think they skipped that part altogether in the film. Wasn't he Salamander army first, and then some other army? I think he did get traded from Bonzo's army, but I I don't know. The, The thing is, the majority of the book is battle school. Yeah. And the majority of battle school is that... War game. Yeah, the war game, the battles, and the, and that was one of the things. I mean, they had a couple that they put in there, but that's the thing. There was such that long progression of really interesting things that happened in the battle school, and they just had to skip it all. They skipped so much of the battle school part. Did they, did they have to skip it all? Well, they didn't have to, but they did. And I was just going to say, yeah, you know, unlike The Hobbit, which didn't need to be turned into three movies, Ender's Game would have been good, not even as three movies, but as one of those, you know, Game of Thrones style TV series where they do just a whole season of Ender's Game where it starts out and you have the first five or six episodes before he even gets into his first army tune. Yeah, whatever. And it just, it, it, I think it would have been really good with that because it had that real good progression and, you know, you had time passing and you had that feeling like you were building towards stuff. Well, okay, I, I, my second biggest complaint about the film is that, is that it felt so compressed into a period of like three months. The whole movie yeah, right. took place in that space of a time, whereas I'm fairly sure that the book started when he was like six years old. And yeah, went I think he was even younger. Was, I think it was, well, no, he might have been six. That sounds about right. It went until he was probably 14 or 15 kind of thing. Right. And I understand that nobody can take a year off unless it's, you know, Robert Zemeckis doing Castaway in the middle of a movie. But it 
felt so rushed and so much less epic, less lofty that it felt like, it, I mean, it could have been during a summer vacation that this whole movie took place. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. And for some things that, that that works, but for what Ender went through and what they made him into, it needed the time and the constant pressure and stress on this boy. And yeah, I think that's my second biggest complaint is just the middle of the film where suddenly we are learning, you know, that the enemy's gate is down and all that was to me the strongest part of the film and it could have used another 40 minutes. Yeah, it really could have could have gone longer. It would have been uh, really helpful. A, a lot of it was rushed. I felt that the whole first section of the film was really rushed. It was like they went through the scenes that existed in the book and they just picked out like okay this is the one line from this scene that we're actually going to have them say right like they were click they were ticking boxes like contractually they had to have the scene with peter they had to have a scene with valentine they had to have the you know kind of thing but they're like okay so we got 30 seconds here 45 seconds there let's get 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 and that happens you know with a movie i mean no not all movies have to be three hours long but when you're trying to create a world and 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 and, and flesh out a bunch of characters, I, I mean, they fleshed Ender out great. But there were a lot of these characters that had names, and the only reason I know their names is because I know the book. Right. And there's a part at the end of the movie where they mention the Ansible. Oh, and I yeah. was just like, well, I know what that is, but I assure you nobody else in here knows that, what that is because you haven't even mentioned it before. Yeah. There are choices that have to be make, made when you're adapting something, but it really did feel like a 90-minute movie or something like that where I would have appreciated a two-hour movie. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was two hours. And what I want is a two-and-a-half-hour two and movie. But on the positive side, they were so faithful to the book. Yeah, I was actually kind of surprised some of the crap they left. I think that, that one part where I turned and said, wow, I can't believe they left this in here, was when they put in the Giant's Drink bit into the film, which, again, unfortunately, it was a rushed thing. You know, the whole game that he would go and play on, the Giant's Drink was something he arrived at after having played this game for months and months and months. And then he played the Giant's Drink thing over and over and over again, and he kept losing. And But, in but he'd the get movie, back up and play it again and yeah. again, yeah. But in the movie, of course, he tries both sides and then, oh, okay, I guess I just got to take the giant's eye out. Okay, let's go. And that was all it took. But yes, I was yeah. surprised that they put that in there at all, especially since they hadn't up until that point. If, if you hadn't read the book, and, and I wish that there was somebody in the back seat right now with big boobs. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. And they're I, out. I wish that there was somebody in the back seat oh. who hadn't read the book so we could ask them this question, but like the point of that video game can only be clear if you've read the book or if you're extraordinarily brilliant and at the end of the movie you go, oh, that's why, you know, it was so barely touched on in the movie that it it might as well not have been there at all. Yeah. I, I mean, maybe that's too harsh to say mm-hmm. because... Because the the we do have a running commentary through the whole movie with Graf and Anderson and Anderson, which is in the book, each chapter would be prefaced with a little conversation with them. And the rest of the time it was always on the kids, whether it's Ender or Valentine and Peter. But that's uh, that's the only adult perspective that we you'd get in the book. But in the movie, they were constantly observing what was going on and letting the audience know what we were supposed to think about it. And, you know, it's like, who put his brother, how did his brother get in the game and all that? You know, so that was for us so we could understand what how we were supposed to take those images that we saw, right? Mm-hmm. It's like no one has ever done that before to burrow in the eye of the of the giant. And, and you know, I, that was a really smart idea. I mean, also, you've got Harrison Ford in there, too, so you pump up his right. importance in the movie. But just the fact that he was always there to stand up and say, look, did you see what he did? He kept kicking him and all that to tell you how you were supposed to feel about it. Or, uh-huh. or sorry, how the, the grown-ups were supposed to feel about it. And 
that's another thing that I think worked really well. The Graf character was there from the very opening scene all the way to the end. Whereas I think in the book, he he was gone for a long stretch and there were other instructors and things like that, right? He, he was just the bat man in the background watching. Yeah, he was just the guy in charge and the person who never gets a said graph in those little things at the start of each chapter. That was the one thing that always somewhat infuriated me about those things is you just had two people talking back and forth with no attributions so you don't know who the freak they are they're just like oh he did this oh oh i can't believe it oh well, <laughs> yeah. i'm gonna say something now because you don't know who i am it's basically the greek chorus yeah but you don't see them but yeah i don't know i i would have really liked it had it had more because that's the thing that i really latched on to with that book i think was each time they they would come up with some impossible challenge, you know. They give him the crappy army, and he has to go and fight, you know, and they'll do different things where the stars are in the different places, and or they'll set it up, you know. And, and there was the stuff that they did, like, you know, Ender would change the way people did stuff, you know, where it, when they first started, I can't remember if it, how it was, but when he first started, I think everybody would always just run out of the gate really fast. And so he would just sit there and watch and then, you know, and then people stopped running out of the gate really fast because he didn't do it. All of that stuff you never, never got to see, which is, it's sad, but yeah, I guess you've got the book for that. So. <laughs> and you know, that's the truth is, is it's, the book is still out there. If they had completely botched it and it's not faithful to the book at all, the book is still out there. And this really is just a Cliff's Notes of the book. Yeah. Yeah, you do get most of the scenes from the book, just in very short succession. Yeah, the the one thing that would have been really awesome had they made it into a mini, not a mini series, but a series series, is you could have gotten Valentine and Peter's stuff, which you knew that was the first thing to go. It's totally not important to Ender's story. It's an entirely separate story, but it was so cool. I loved that bit when that started coming up and stuff. And I was just like, oh, this is awesome. So it's sad to not well, the, see it. The thing that was neat about that for me, and maybe for you too, but you read it as a kid, was just all this crazy idea of a worldwide communication system where everybody had a computer and could talk to other people and hear what other people were saying. I mean, it was the internet is uh-huh. what he was talking about. And... Yeah, emailing and message boards and and posts and all this stuff and the chatter on the internet. All that stuff was so prescient, you know, all this stuff that we just take as, yeah, that's how the world is now, card envisioned for this future. Yeah. That book came out in what, like 86 or something like that? Yeah, I think so. 85 or 86. And uh, they, Valentine and Peter made up personas for themselves in order to affect politics, affect public perception and public will, uh, to get people to make the choices they wanted them to make. And that was really, really interesting. And Peter was such a brilliant mind, too, that he was just doing all that he could to help himself, to put himself into a position where when he came out and said, I am this guy, that he would be able to rule the world. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, none of that is necessary for an Ender's Game movie, but it, Peter was a big deal in the book because he was the boogeyman, more so than the buggers that were always lurking in Ender's psyche and Ender's life. You know, I don't want to be Peter. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's too bad that he was so very minor because of the way they had to do things. But, uh, you know, it's... It's the way it goes when you adapt a book. They always have way more in them than a, a film can possibly show you in a, a two-hour time span. And yeah, I, I mean, it is possible that there's a longer cut out there that we'll get on video, and I don't know. But I would be really interested to see how much of the Battle School stuff they shot and, you know, if that would change my feeling for the movie if suddenly it did expand on all of that and we knew who, who halai was and knew who dink was that his name dink yes. meeker dink meeker i don't think they and, had hot soup in there at all did they 
He was a Chinese kid, right? Yeah, I don't remember uh, ever seeing him. They threw Bean in in the freaking same shuttle, which uh, A, was surprising because Bean was supposed to be somebody he meets for the first time when he gets assigned to his army. Uh. But also, he wasn't even all that small. Like, no. I would, I would. Bonzo. <laughs> yeah, Bonzo, Bonzo Madrid, Madrid was like was the, the smallest. smallest dude in the freaking world. That guy was supposed to be the threatening guy that was going to kill Ender, and Ender towered over him. Ender was supposed to be relatively small because he was because younger he was than everybody else. Yeah. And yet, still, he towered over. That had to have been a conscious choice. It had to have been. Because not only was he the ugliest kid in the entire galaxy, <laughs> but he was somehow shriveled and Gollum esque. Yeah, you could have cast a six foot two, fourteen year old or something like that for that role, and instead, yeah, that just some or it's, I don't science maybe, experiment gone awry. <laughs> maybe they just could not find enough kids to put in a performance. I mean, that, I think that was always an, another one of the things that held this movie back from being made is. Where do we get enough kids to fill all the parts in this show that aren't just absolutely horrible Jake Lloyd type kids who, if I remember right, he was at one point considered to be Ender. Yeah, I think when you and I saw Orson Scott Card, he was talking about Jake Lloyd being Ender. But that was before Phantom Menace had come out. And then once Phantom Menace came out, nobody wanted Jake Lloyd. So (laughs) that put the kibosh on that. But... Asa Butterfield, the kid that plays Ender, I thought he did a great job. He conveyed actual intelligence. It didn't sound like he was just repeating lines. It sounded like he knew what he was saying. Mm -hmm. Plus, he did a damn American accent through the whole movie, which can't be easy when you're a kid and having to memorize all these lines, too. I, I, I think he did an admirable job. Luckily, you know, they beefed up Harrison Ford's part, so he got to do some of the heavy lifting. But it was mostly on this kid. Yeah. And so I, you know, I, I hope this guy goes far. This guy, this kid. You hope he turns out to be, who was a kid actor that made it as an adult? Not a, not a girl though, a guy. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. There's Drew Barrymore who, who made it. Yeah, Jodie Foster and Drew Barrymore Jody are probably Foster. good examples, even though Drew Barrymore did have her dark period. But, like, Haley Joel Osment seemed like he was going to be that guy, but he's gone. He went away. Yeah, I don't know what to tell you on that. I mean, he was a, a nominated for an Oscar when he was young, wasn't he? For The Sixth Sense, yeah. So, But it could be that he chose not to pursue it. And if this kid, the Ender kid, chooses not to pursue it too, that's fine. But if he chooses to pursue it, I hope that it works out. <laughs> Yeah. I'd like to see a few make it out unscathed. It's like a freaking meat grinder to be a child actor in Hollywood. They, they put kids on in on one side and effed up drug addicts come out <laughs> the other end. <laughs> I might as well just say the thing that is my, one, my chief complaint about the movie was just how dour and unpleasant the whole thing was. The only joy in the whole movie is that scene with the zero G where you're just experiencing the joy of, you know, doing the laser tag thing. Mm -hmm. And it's gone so fast. And, you you know, I know that Ender's Game is a treatise on child soldiers and on war being hell or whatever, but I just felt sick at the end. I mean, it's just, they, they did, they even stole the triumph of earth winning this war from the, the book. I, holy crap. My excitement and joy at the realization that it, that we had won, that it wasn't just a game. I'll never forget where I was and how I felt when I read that part. It was just one of the true joys of reading of my whole life was getting to the end of Ender's Game and seeing all these people hugging and crying. And he still doesn't know why, why, why are you all doing this? It, yes, I passed the final. Oh my gosh. And yeah, there was none of that. It's like he didn't even have 10 seconds of hooray for Ender. It was like, now I'm a genocide. You know, we wiped them out. We are no better than they are. We are terrible. People bad. War bad. You adults bad. 
the end. And now, granted, there was the awful little coda that Card put at the end of the book. And I don't, I shouldn't say awful because it's set up a bunch of really good sequels. You know, those, Speaker for the Dead and all those are great books. Mm -hmm. And if it weren't for that coda that he put in with the egg, those books would not exist. Or, well, maybe they would, but they wouldn't have the through line of him trying to find a planet for that egg. But it just, oh my gosh, instead of feeling like hope or triumph or joy at the end, it was just, I felt so bad for everything, you know what I mean? Yeah, I and that and that And that's my choice, or my interpretation of the thing. But also, I just felt like that was the agenda they were trying to get out there, is to say, hey, it doesn't matter what your purpose is. The end does not justify the means. Of, you know, using these kids and taking away their innocence and all that stuff, it doesn't matter. Whereas I personally think it, it probably does. It does matter. And, you know, if, if one young person has to give up their future for the rest of us, then that person's a hero. Then that's a great sacrifice. And then, then, then that person needs to be lauded. I, I And I don't know. I guess... Uh, we're in a very cynical time, and that's probably part of Card's, one of his rules. He's like, hey, you guys can't F with this. I want it to be unhappy at the end well, that we've wiped out the four mix. <laughs> that's funny that you should say that, because I think the first time, well, it was when he said four mix and astronauts. Yeah, huh? we're going to play four mix and astronauts. Let's play four mix and astronauts instead of saying buggers and astronauts. Made me sad. It made me sad, too. And maybe we don't even have to go into it, but it's just, if anybody is going to call them buggers, it's going to be Peter, or it's going to be some kid. And, yeah, holy cow, man. I mean, it's it's, it's fine that it was a, a United Colors of Benetton ad when he got to battle school, but the, it just felt so PC to change it from buggers to formix. Yeah. <sighs> Oh, wait, wait, one more thing. <sighs> they they pulled their punches on the whole two bullies, too, the deaths of the two bullies. I mean, we they don't come out and say that everything is all right with them, but Graf tells Ender that Bonzo is going to go back to Earth and he's fine or whatever, and there's never any mention. You know what I mean? Because in the book, he just neutralizes the bullies kind of a thing, and, and you don't know that they've been killed until one of those little side conversations that they're having, and this is like hundreds of pages after each one, when you finally discover this. But yeah, I don't know. It was I figured that they would have said that he'd done that because they kept talking about how, oh, he's, he's going to do the thing so that they won't they'll win all the battles kind of a thing all the other ones down the line yeah i waited for the other shoe to drop and the, and it never does we don't have a scene between those two where they mention what actually happened and uh, it's consistent with the whole war is hell kind of thing but they they didn't so what did you think of the way it all looked did it seem like what you imagined at all when you imagined the uh thing as a kid or not as a kid reading the book no it didn't it, except for the scene on the raft which i mean is easy for you to imagine because we've all been to a lake i i think i saw it as much more of a sterile star trek everything is pretty and, and all that stuff and this had a lot of grays and shadows and and the the technology of of the space station was so hyper detailed and stuff that I mean, probably much more realistic for now, but I don't have a problem with that. The The special effects were all really, really good. Mm -hmm. and Which I'm sure has to be pretty difficult, the, the zero gravity thing. Yeah, that's, I'm sure, was, was except for Harrison Ford, was the biggest expense <laughs> of that movie was getting that stuff to look right. And there were a couple of moments where I was just like, oh, they probably just did wire removal here because you can tell something is holding him and all that. But but who cares? It's like I've never been in zero G, so I don't know exactly how that works and stuff. But I, I know there have been like comic books and 
graphic novel depictions of Ender's Game and all that stuff. And I've never looked at any of that stuff to say, oh, well, it didn't look like this, but it was all brought together in a very realistic way. And maybe 10 years from now, it will look dated because of that. I don't uh-huh. know. Did the battle room seem like something that you would have imagined? Or? No, no, not at all. And I think I probably imagined it like the holodeck on the Enterprise, where, you know, it was just black or it was completely, there were no details or, at all. Yeah, see, when I imagined it, I imagined it sealed. Or not sealed, but, you know, like closed so you don't see space. This right. whole thing was like a bunch of windows, which made it well, it's much seem busier. more open. I don't know, it, that, but you know, it was cool. It looked really neat. I wish they'd done more with it. <laughs> I wish they'd been able to do the whole, a lot of the battles, because there were so many of them, and uh, was in, so interesting to see them throw challenges at Ender, and Ender find a way to deal with each one. Yeah, I wish we had gotten more of that because also, that's the only time when he has a good time. That's the only time when there is joy in that movie is when he's out there using his mind not to hurt people but just to outthink people and to to make this game matter and that might be a real difficulty in conveying that to an audience you know it's like quidditch or something like that how do you convince the audience that quidditch is important that it's important that you beat slytherin or whatever the deal is but in the book it was just hammered into us that that's what the kids lived for. That was their, that was all of the sports and all of their recreation combined. And Ender never lost. No matter what, how they, they made it unfair or stacked the deck against him, he would somehow come out on top. Even if it meant, you know, sacrificing all of his team members except for one and, and you know, do, doing things that nobody had ever done before that shouldn't have worked. Yeah, oh, I loved that because he became a celebrity. Uh He became somebody that everybody, maybe that some people hated him, but most people admired him, wanted to be on his team, wanted to pick his brain, wanted to do what he did. And that was part of becoming a military leader is convincing people, you got to follow this guy's orders, no matter how crazy they are. So so again, I'm just pushing for more of that middle of the movie thing. Just, Just an expansion there. But, you know, it's not to say that I didn't like the movie. I, I, I thought that it was well done. And yeah, it, the faithfulness to the book is really admirable. I just, uh, I felt like it ended on a down note when it didn't have to. Yeah. Because the book does not end on a down note. I have to admit that I didn't, I was somewhat surprised that they went with that, you know, with all the stuff that they had to keep in and what they were going to keep out, that they bothered to have the giants drink, to have the the game show him where the egg's going to be, to have him get the egg at the end, and then say, oh, I'm going to find a place for it, yay. Instead of just having it be like Independence Day, where, you know, hey, we finally beat those evil aliens, yay. And it was just, it was a trick to get Ender to do it, but we did it, yay. Kind of a triumphant ending instead. Since they obviously are not going to go on and make Speaker for the Dead... They're not going to go on and make Xenocide. They're not going to go on and make uh, Children of the Mind. So why do we have to have that? (laughs) Because that's all that stuff was, was a prologue for those. And we know we're not going to those, so why put the prologue in? Uh, Just kind of a little frustrating, I guess. When they left stuff that would have been cool out... To keep that stuff in, and kind of, yeah, gave you that kind of downer ending in the process. But anyways, yeah, I think that's all I got to say about Ender's Game. Do you have more that you want to touch on? I'm sure we could come up with more. I don't need to say any more. No, I would be interested to hear of somebody who hadn't read the book if it meant anything to them, if it affected them. Say, so yeah, you and I complained. Okay, I complained about the ad campaign they always made it clear that it wasn't a game, that it was really war. But the movie didn't do that at all. The movie did do the tricking thing, although you had that count, a ticking clock that had like 24 days before the fleet reaches the homeworld or whatever, which I'm sure the book didn't have. You know, we just assumed, like, like they 
they stay in the book, in the movie, that Mazer Rackham is the opponent that he has to beat. They came right out and said that in the book, and there was no reason for us to distrust them. Uh huh. Whereas in this, at least we saw that and we knew that they weren't being truthful. And, and that's just a choice that, that the director made, the writer made, but it might have dampened somebody's enjoyment of the, the film if they had in the back of their mind the whole time that it is real and like, because there's that moment when the two ships crash into each other. And that meant something to me because I knew there were really people on those ships and all the kids just go, Oh shoot. You know, this isn't, this is going to hurt our grade or whatever. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so, I mean, that's probably an example of, you know, knowing that it's real makes that scene have more weight, but I'm, that may be the only one. <laughs> yeah but all in all I would say it was a good movie and it was worth the watch I really enjoyed it and yeah there's very few movies that I see that are so wonderful that I'm not going to find something to complain about um, but yeah that, I thought that was definitely worth the watch even if you've read the book and you know you're afraid that it's going to not be faithful you won't probably have a problem with it you know unless you're like the Lord of the Rings freaks who were like, Oh, Sheila was supposed to be in this one, not in that one. Oh, I'm so mad. <laughs> then maybe you're going to have a problem because I'm sure you can find something to complain about. But uh, otherwise, I still say, yeah, I, I expect you to enjoy it. I can't believe they didn't put in Tom Bomb again. <sighs> All right. Uh, I guess we're done, right? I, I guess we are the the next week Thor comes out. So I guess we know what we'll be doing next episode. Yeah, days. Days from when we saw Ender's Game, it will be coming out. So yeah, that will be our next stop on the winter season of films. So get ready. Uh, I'm Big... I'm... What's that one? <laughs> I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield, and the Enemies podcast is down. Good. Let's keep it down. That Gets My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons attribution, no derivatives license. Doesn't that make you just feel sick inside? <laughs>